for August 24th, 2020. Um, the meeting is, is not being held in person. It's being recorded via Zoom and participation for anyone they could raise their hand or uh, wave at the camera if they're on camera and we can go to them if needed uh, or I shouldn't say if needed, we will uh, I'll let them, I'll identify them and let them speak when the time comes. Uh, we do have a couple of members who aren't with us just yet. Josephine Cartesi, she's the new member to the B1 committee that's representing the Zoning Board of Appeals after Devin Howe stepped down earlier this couple months ago. And then Aaron Hunt is, uh, will be with us shortly. He's at a baseball playoff game with his uh, children or children, one child or two, I'm not sure, but any event. The first item on the agenda for tonight was a follow up relative to 40R. I did have a chance to speak call uh, Bill Rail, who's the program director from uh, Department of Housing Community Development of 40R. And uh, what I did is I went over the presentation that, that was provided at the last B1 meeting on some of the points. Um, in particular, uh, the time frame associated between application review process and total time for adoption of a 40 R district, which in the slide from the last time was six to 12 months, which um, was, a, was a fair estimate of time. There's a, between the review process at the state, uh, an application submittal from the town, they have up to 90 days to first review an application um, when it's submitted to them. And then the comments will go back to the town. So between you know, the, the three month review process and then sequencing with, you know, a town meeting, you could see how the schedule might be as quick as six months or more likely a year's time frame. So it depends as we're sitting right now in August, you know, we're probably realistically, if, if the decision is to go forward, wouldn't be till next fall uh, before it probably would get to it a town meeting vote, just the general terms. But at the moment, that's, that's a ways away. Um, another point that I did touch on was the actual, the financial incentives from the state. One is the creation of the district, which happens in, in the beginning phase. And based upon how many potential future units could be created through the district, depends um, on the scale of the incentive payment. So it's a sliding scale. Um, one of the things that they have done now with the program on the, incent on the incentive payment, the first one, is it depends on the district and whether or not there is a higher likelihood of seeing uh, units in the earlier term of a 40-hour district. So that, and that, it's twofold. One is there maybe potential development that is kind of fostering the movement of the 40 yard district, or is there infrastructure that may need to be addressed in order to facilitate the development? So depending upon what they would, you know, that what they would evaluate through the whole process, how likely that um, development was to happen from a timing standpoint. So you might not get the first incentive payment right away. It might be contingent. It'd be approved subject to potential condition. But there is, um, there is funding through the Department of Housing Community Development. It's through their capital program. Um, and that's been a change in the funding source before it was from the, the trust fund from the earlier versions, earlier days when the 40 hour program. So they do have, so everybody who has a 40 hour district, there was some that got delayed. They, those communities have been paid. So everybody is up to date as far as payments go from, from the beginning phase of incentive payments up to uh, uh, creation of unit incentive payments all the way up to 40S as well. So those have all been paid in full. Rolling forward, um, like, he's, uh, like Bill mentioned, the funding is, is much they're in a better position to be able to fund the projects as they go forward, as the change has occurred 
through the department. Um, the incentive payments per creation of a unit, again, that would just happen on a unit basis. But they want the real fundamental things that I want the takeaway that I want to talk about tonight is you have to think about it in terms of not necessarily conventional zoning, but think of it more as an overlay. Because, for example, we used my for my call to him, we used nine Liberty Lane, which is the stop and shop property. The stop shop property could be broken into smaller parts. So for example, the 40R is an overlay which sits on top, but it can then be broken down into a sub-district. So it can be a portion part of the property. So it's a roughly a, a five acre parcel. There could be a decision that in, you know, in this particular area, maybe it's an acre or a half acre, whatever that might be, would be a sub-district of the 40R. So for example, you might wanna have a section which is for single family homes, which could be townhouses. You could have a sub-district for that type of residential use. Conversely, you might have another sub-district area for mixed use. So there's flexibility in, in the overlay district and sub-districts. And overall, Norfolk Center would fall under the category of a TOD criteria as far as what that TOD district would be going in as, as, an, as an application. They don't necessarily need to be contiguous. I think we talked about that before, but just reaffirming that they, again, they don't need to be contiguous to each other. They can float. You have, like I said, Norfolk Center, but then you could have smaller little sub-districts where if uh, people felt appropriate to add those in there. So there's flexibility as far as that design goes. Um, there are, I, I did discuss with them the towns that we looked at as far as perhaps modeling to see how the 4 yard would go, which for, which were uh, Easton, Sharon, Natick, and then Norwood. Uh, I, I do have to get some more information from Bill, but he suggested that Belmont might be one that we could take a look at just from the notion of having a smaller sub-district on a larger parcel um, to get to see how that would look. So he was gonna try to provide, I don't have that as of yet, but this, certainly if we were interested in that, he could provide that information to us. <clears throat> and then the larger questions as far as, you know, how big, how small, those are local decisions. So he said, again, he doesn't really have his only general guidance is that it's, it's probably something that starting out smaller might be a more appropriate way to go to, to kind of gain your foothold and experience and going through the process and then come back. But again, that's more of a, that's a more of a local decision. I did ask him about, there was some 40 R districts that went back to 40 B applications. And from his recollection, those, those projects, really were 40 Bs that the town approached the developer to consider 40 R. And because of the process, you know, going to town meeting to try to get the overlay district approved with design guidelines going through the state that has stretched out the approval process. So they decided to return back to a 40 B. But um, that was his um, thoughts and some of those other ones that again, went from 40R back to 40B. Um, the one thing which we did touch upon that might be, you know, I want to get people's attention would be the fact that through the 40R, the development is as of right. So it's not a special permit. So that's, that's something that he said, you know, for some communities that, you know, can be very challenging. And, and so he's, he did say that, and which we did talk about that a little bit, because if you were to have the district adopted with the design guidelines, it would go through the permitting process through the planning board, but it would be as of right. So it's a different uh, development process. But uh, well, those are some of the, the bigger points that I touched on with him. 
And uh, the last point, and then I'll open up for any questions, was that if we wanted to have him attend a future Zoom meeting to um, talk about the 40-hour program a little bit more, uh, Q&A, he's open to doing that. And so he would uh, you know, welcome that opportunity if people thought that that might be helpful, again, for that one-on-one -on -one contact to ask questions. But so I'll, I'll pause right here and, and uh, throw it out for any questions that people might have um, at the moment. Rich, could, could you just clarify what the, the developments that were 40B that tried to move to 40R and ended up going back to 40B? Was, was that because 40R was not in place yet in the town and the town was trying to push that forward? That, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They didn't have the, the district wasn't in place. Right. As of yet. So. Uh, hey, Rich, I have a quick question about the site plan review process. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. One of the aspects of 40R from the Mass.gov website is that projects must be developable under the community smart growth zoning adopted under Chapter 40R, either as of right or through a limited plan review process akin to site plan review. Has that changed? Yeah, some, some towns actually don't have a plan review process. They just have it as of right. There is no review process at all through the, the planning board. Um, I, I will say I don't just to be clear for the record, I don't think any of us would consider something of that, I'll call it liberal or open as far as development goes. It would be through a, a, a review process through the planning board. So because you have some of those smaller 40 r districts, so you can see in those cases where it would perhaps make sense. But I think in our application, we'd be talking about going through a planning board review process. Okay, I just wanted to clarify because I think that when people see as of right, they imagine that a developer is mailing in a form and starting construction the following Monday without anybody really doing anything with it. So it's good to clarify as to what that process would look like at the local level. Thanks. Yeah, good question. Yep. So is there any uh, other questions at the moment? If not, we could certainly come back to it. Uh, one other point of clarification, Rich, uh, you said in your conversation that uh, the gentleman, I think his name is Bill, had identified that starting off smaller was a good means to be able to um, implement aspects of 40R on a smaller scale and then look to expand later on down the road if the impact is uh, within the community's expectations. Um, did he happen to talk about size or scale of a specific project that he was talking about. Um, I know that the majority of 40 r projects that are proposed and implemented right now in the state are, you know, closer to 100, 200, 300 units, but obviously we'd be looking at something much, much smaller in scale uh, for our purposes. So did you happen to touch on that at all? Identify that there was a preference from the state's perspective? They didn't really necessarily have a preference. It was more what the community felt they could comfortably, you know, put together the bylaw, present to town meeting, um, and let people, the pub, you know, the public at, at large be aware of uh, what's involved with it. Um, what we did, so what I did talk to them about was I just, as a, for example, I used, you know, stop and shop property, and then the two other properties on Liberty Lane, so six and eight Liberty Lane as as a district um and as as a total aggregate area that's not that wouldn't be a a very large district but he certainly um you know he said it was up to us i think i think the one thing that um you know i, I think that the consideration for us to a degree would be that we, if we're going to potentially invest the energy and the time, and I and the thought being hopefully it's going to produce a result, is that we maybe get a little better sense from the properties that within that district that we're we're more likely to see a development come out of it. So it's not that we bring forward a district and then it just sits there. 
and we don't really see anything out of it um, because he does have, you know, there are some districts that, like I mentioned to you, um, they did create a district which hasn't generated any production of any housing at all. And, and those are, you know, they're taking a closer eye at those districts as they come forward that they are really, I'll say, you know, closer to being viable, you know, or there's interest in them and not just sit there without anything. Because again, if you remember, if you want to remove the district, you have to go back through the process. You know, you have to go through town meeting, you have to go back to DHC to remove it. So I think having a district in place that people are comfortable with sitting there, it may sit there for a while, um, but yet if other development occurs around, there's a, there's a comfort level because there might be multiple factors that don't make it happen. It could, you know, so that's, that's kind of the, I, I just get the sense. I mean, you know, I could be wrong, misreading them, but I don't think, I think if we had identified a much larger 40 yard district that was done over periods of years, you know, like you, okay, here's the base idea. If this is a good idea, we just break it down in smaller chunks, you know, over time than one large district. Cause it, again, it just, it's there, which is good in one sense, right? It's adopted, ready to go. But um, at the same time, things might change over time and we might, you know, that there's pros and cons of that, you know, actually make it a district too, too expansive. And I think, I think uh, when we segue to Josh's uh, presentation, I think some of the things I just talked about in general terms are probably, you know, if you take, take a look well, as we get into Josh's work, think about it in context of 40R. I think it's, uh, I'm sure we'll probably be talking about something that's more discreet, you know, not a large 40R district that uh, to, to wet our, you know, get our feet wet, so to speak, that we're comfortable with. No regrets, so to speak, right? We put something forward that people support and once it's there, it's there and we're comfortable as opposed to an overreach. So um, having said that, I think I'll, I'll sway, segue to, to Josh. And unfortunately, Susan, you won't get the presentation to see it live, but uh, I'll have Josh send it to me and then I can email it out afterwards so you could take a look at it so josh if you want to i can probably see it if he's screen sharing it's just not going to be very big so okay if there's yes anything so, specific that you need me to know to discuss just make sure to point it out okay all right yeah he's going to screen share it so josh i'll turn it over to hey, you hey rich before we turn really quick before we transition over to josh uh yeah. you had outlined some more specifics related to 40 r uh, did you want to open it up to anybody who's joining the call for their questions before we turn it over and move on uh sure i mean is any other committee members or the public that had a specific question for 40 r before we turn it over to josh we could always come back to so it's not as if we can't, but um, I don't see any hands at the moment or people waving at me. So I think we'll go to Josh. I think, I think that's really what uh, is the main show tonight. I think uh, it'll be, so I turn it over to you, sir. Thank you, Rich. Good evening, everyone. Good to see you all be one committee members. Uh, Josh Fiala, Principal Planner at MAPC, I've been with you all for a while now. I, I'll also take this moment to acknowledge my colleague who you can see is named Courtney Lewis, who's in the land use department with me. Courtney was curious about our work here, so I uh, invited him and encouraged him to take a drop in and, and hear the presentation this evening. Um, so I'll share my screen and I will send this presentation out to you all. I apologize for not getting it to you in advance, but. Uh, it turned out there was a fair amount of work to do to get this prepared. So um, I just got it completed. I'll, I'll share it to you and you can look at it at your leisure after I present it this evening. Um, so I'll, I'll dive right in. We had a few agenda items which we talked through and outlined the work which I've, I've now um, completed. Uh, so we had 
a re re revisitation of the build out analysis. Um, we did a version of a build out analysis back with the recommendations of the report, but it was, um, I think, in need of an update based upon uh, the conversations and, and just clarifying, uh, and I think bringing it up to uh, where, where we currently are with the recommendations. And then also looking at a build out with the parcels assembled as we talked about last meeting and seeing how that differs from the current parcel layouts. And then also looking at a financial feasibility analysis. Um, the district illustration I did not complete for this evening. I'll just cut to that punchline. Um, and I think, I think we can, while we can still do that, I think the conversation we had this evening would actually be better to have before I do that to see if we want to adjust the illustrations in any way before I take the time to, to prepare those. So let's get into the build out analysis first. So here is the updated uh, susceptibility to change analysis on the parcels within the B1 district. We talked about this last meeting, but this is up to, up to date based upon our conversation. Um, so the red parcels are uh, unlikely to change in the future. They are either recently developed, uh, recently approved for development or municipal properties that are not likely to change like town hall or the library, for example. I think everyone would agree with, with those pretty well. Uh, the green parcels are those which we feel are most likely to change in the near term. There's no guarantee that they will change uh, at all or in the near term, it's up to the property owners, of course, uh, but we see that they are uh, largely vacant parcels that are uh, in that way underutilized and therefore a good development opportunity. Uh, and then we look at the yellow parcels as a little bit, little bit different. They are uh, likely to change in the longer term. They have buildings on them presently. Uh, it takes a little bit more um, in terms of the redevelopment scenario to uh, uh, undertake the costs of removing the existing buildings and redeveloping the property. It's not, those aren't vacant sites for the most part, or they are town owned properties as you see uh, down Main Street to the right of the slide, um, where the town would have to go through a disposition process for those to be developable. So that's, that's the um, foundation for the build-out analysis. And first, in terms of the build-out analysis, we will focus on those green parcels where the change is more likely in the near term. And then we'll shift and talk about the change likely in the long term. So uh, I always have a lot of caveats about these build out analyses, uh, just in terms of the way that they're prepared and the uh, assumptions that go into them. Um, so these are the assumptions which are go have gone into the framing of uh, the assignment. If you recall, we, we agreed to do uh, sort of a maximized build out to understand the, uh, I think, Aaron was referring to them as bookends for the, for the potential build out of the district. So we can understand if, if the zoning recommendations were to pass as they were recommended by MAPC uh, and build out were to occur over the next you know, intervening years and or decades, um, what, what's the maximum that could be potentially coming through from those changes? Um, so this is based upon these zoning characteristics which you see on the screen, a maximum building footprint of 20,000 square feet no limitations on the number of bedrooms per unit, a density uh, for residential uses of 16 units per acre, a building height up to 46 feet to the midpoint of the roof with a maximum of three and a half stories, uh, buildings to a front build to line between six and 19 feet from the property line, parking uh, required at one space per residential unit with a shared parking reduction that's allowed up to 30% of the combined residential and commercial requirements. The building program requires that there be mixed, it'd be a mixed use program with commercial uses on the ground floor um, and that residential uses would be about allowed above uh, the ground floor uh, on a primary building. And then I did include the notion of a secondary building which cannot occur everywhere of course, but on properties where it can, I considered secondary buildings to be allowed to have residential completely. Uh, that, this includes 15% affordable units required in a development with 10 or more units, 
Um, I think I actually did, in the terms of the build out numbers, apply that just across the board, whether or not it was 10 or more units. Um, and then it all has also uh, accommodated, uh, these are massing diagrams, so it's not, not architecture that we're looking at, but I still, in any case, did try to uh, follow the content of the design guidelines. So a height step down to lower existing structures that may be adjacent to the properties, uh, reducing the building into increments of 40 foot bays so that they have a smaller uh, feel, reducing the sense of scale overall through that measure. Um, the, the positioning of buildings to frame outdoor plazas, uh, have the ability for landscaping, generous landscaping, and placing the parking to the rear of the structure. A lot of the features of those guidelines don't show up because I haven't yet drawn trees. Um, this is just a, a, an urban design uh, massing model. So uh, a lot of, before I get into the actual images and numbers, there are a fair amount of challenges in, in an analysis like this. Um, as we discussed and ha has been requested, it depicts a maximized scenario, but that maximization is unlikely to occur in reality. So it, it tells you um, what is the most possible under sort of all circumstances aligning appropriately for the maximized development to occur. But the reality is um, there are any number of uh, encumbrances to parcels which will, will cause them to not occur, not to develop in a maximized way. So those include the um, sort of desires and ambitions of individual property owners. Not every property owner is looking to redevelop their property. That's number one. Number two, uh, these scenarios um, assume uh, Wastewater is fully accomplished in the district. So either through an offsite package treatment plant, which is shared amongst the properties or uh, fully sewer and fully sewer district. So that, that's a, a very big assumption, but that's one that I think you would all agree we, we, should, we should have made because you're looking for that maximized scenario and the town's exploring ways to improve wastewater capacity. Um, so that's, uh, that is in reality a big constraint. Uh, one of the other big constraints is the ability for the market to um, uh, absorb the areas that are being built. So both in terms of housing units, which in our region, we've, we've found a, a, a very good uh, ability to absorb housing units. That's less of the concern, I think. But the, I think the bigger concern is the ability to absorb commercial space and to find leasable tenants for those spaces. Um, so this is... Uh, also, a building massing diagram is what I would call it. It's, it looks kind of like architecture. There's little buildings with roofs and they've got shape, but this is, I have not taken the time to architecturally design and think through all of these. So it will look a little bit monotonous and the patterns are, are similar just for um, the, the ability of trying to get through this type of thing. Uh, and so that's, that's all the assumptions and caveats I've got for you. I'm sure there, there are some others that we'll find along the way. But let's dive right into some of the actual content now. I guess are there, I'll pause. Are there questions about any of that lead up? Okay. Sorry, Josh, a little late. This is Aaron. Hi, Aaron. Um, no questions, but I just wanted to say, I think that's exactly what we talked about. And um, I like the sewer assumption too. It, it errs on the side of more. So I think that's what we were going for again, when you mentioned the word bookends uh, that I mentioned. So. Anyway, looks like a great start. Thanks. Very good. That's, pro that's promising. So at least I've done the right assignment. Um, so, all right. So the here, so here's the look at the change more likely in the near term parcels, the green ones again, and I'm just going to flip the screen and you'll see um, the build out analysis for those parcels. And so these are, um, let me just try something actually. Let's see if you can. Can you see my screen now? Is it the actual model? Yes. No, the, map. the green model with the with the red outline, the revisit build out analysis. Oh, it's still that. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Let me see. The well, parcels I'll, are the filled in. Let me just so, stay yeah. on the. Yeah, I'll stay on the PowerPoint. Sorry, I was going to I was going to try to be tricky and switch to the actual building model, which 
Um, maybe we'll do that after we get in, get through the presentation, but I'll just do this because it's framed nicely. But um, so the, the build out analysis on those parcels, there's eight parcels there. Um, that includes six Liberty Lane, eight Liberty Lane of which there's two parcels, 175 Main Street, 201 Main Street, seven Liberty Lane and nine Liberty Lane. So that's 13 acres of property. Uh, you can see there, um, in this case, it's effectively one, one building, one massing model that we're showing uh, for each of the uh, parcels. Um, so you have uh, a building that's maximized for the size of the parcel while complying with the parking requirements, uh, the height requirements, the building footprint requirements, et cetera. So a few observations about what the this shows in terms of findings here. Um, there, there wasn't just one limiting factor in terms of the zoning constraints, the, the different characteristics of zoning, which were recommended. On some of the parcels, it was the uh, parking requirements that actually uh, limited the amount of development that you could uh, put on the parcel. In other cases, it was the maximum density of 16 units per acre. That was the limiting factor. And then in the, the case of uh, 201 Main Street and Nine Liberty Lane, which are the largest of the two parcels, it was the maximum building footprint size of 20,000 square feet. That was the limiting factor. So you can see uh, the, the largest, uh, hopefully you can see my cursor, but the largest building here and the largest building here on 201 Main Street and Nine Liberty Lane are the two that reach that maximum building footprint. The others uh, do not. And overall, so here the, the, by the numbers. Josh, real quick, sorry if I could jump in. I just, sure. just kind of wanted to add some language. I, I think the interesting thing and uh, about the fact that in this analysis, there were three different of our parameters that became the limiting factors speaks to the effort that was put into the limiting factors and the items that were proposed. In other words, it's, it's the, the, uh, <clears throat> the limiting factors that we discussed as a group for the, the, the district, each one of them is coming into play in the different size lots, you know, different ones are coming into play in different size lots. And that's exactly what they're supposed to do. Agreed. Thank, thanks for that comment, Aaron. Yes, so that's, I, to me, it indicates a, a balancing of those characteristics because one is not dominant and, and it see it, you, you get in the combination of those characteristics nuance between all of the variables about parcel size, what's being built on it, how it works. And, and I think it, uh, hopefully, uh, it addresses one of the concerns that I think we've talked about as a group, which is how, how this uniform set of characteristics would operate on a varied set of parcel sizes. And, and I think it actually, uh, it does respond to those parcel sizes quite well. Uh, and it allows uh, development to occur in a, in a maximized way on any of those parcel sizes um, in the district. So, uh, in, in for example, here on the, the corner at, uh, I believe that's six Liberty Lane, um, it's, a, it's a building which faces the street. It would define that edge. It has parking tucked behind it for the requirements um, and works very well on a larger parcel like the nine Liberty Lane side. Again, it has buildings that are uh, addressing the street frontage, but then it has a larger field of parking at the center of the site. And it would have the potential even for a third building structure, uh, which is, uh, would, could be residential only because it's not on the street frontage. Um, and there's still uh, space left over for shared amenities, open spaces, maybe even a, a community pool or, or those types of things, which might come along uh, with a, a housing uh, and mixed use development. So uh, let me just go back to those numbers. You can see here the, across those eight parcels, the variation in building footprint that you see, uh, the numbers of residential units that would be associated with those massing models, uh, the density that uh, uh, occurs. And where the density is less than 16 units per acre, it's because you just can't fit more onto those parcels with the parking that's required uh, primarily. Uh, and then you can see the commercial area, which would be the ground floor with some of the area taken out of the ground floor for the vertical circulation, which is required to get people up to the residential units, of course. Uh, and then the amount of parking that would be supporting all of those uses. 
So that's um, 200 units uh, aggregated across those eight parcels or 13 acres, which is, results in a little less than the 16 units per acre, overall 15 units per acre. And 77,000 square feet of sort of net leasable commercial area I think that's probably already approaching a number for Norfolk Town Center, which may be difficult to fill, in my opinion. We, haven't, we don't have a uh, market analysis to understand that in exact detail, but my, my feeling is that that's getting to be a large figure already. All right, so let me just keep going and then we can, uh, I'll try to speed along a little bit so we can uh, have plenty of time for discussion. So this is looking at the longer term parcels. There are 20 of those parcels uh, going all the way from the, the collection of parcels at the corner of Boardman and Main Street down to the center of Main Street itself, uh, moving down to some of the single properties on Rockwood Road, and then uh, down to the end of Main Street where you have the uh, town-owned property. I'm just getting to its address, which is at, oh, I guess its address is listed as 98 Main Street. One of them are, are blank in terms of the address number. So, um, let me just advance to the next slide so you can see the overall massing for there. So again, this assumes all of those properties have redeveloped in that maximizing way. So even the properties that have existing buildings today, those buildings have been uh, removed and then the, the new buildings have been uh, relocated on the properties in such a way where the parking is to the rear and the building is addressing the street, which is what you want in the town center. Um, and the, again, all of these uh, diagrams are in compliance with those zoning requirements that I showed you on the slide. And, and what we see is similar to what showed up on those first set of parcels, that you have a variation of uh, parking requirements, the density maximum, or the maximum height, uh, which are the constraining factor. And then on the town of Norfolk properties to the right of the screen over here, uh, those are the ones, only ones in this case, where it showed up that the maximum building footprint was the constraining factor. So you can see um, it's, it's, a, it's a pattern which I think re responds to the individual parcel sites. It does create some uh, variation and in interest in terms of what's, what's going on. I, I, I do believe it has, is retaining uh, the, the village feel. Um, let me just get to the numbers real quick for that. So this is, this is in addition to the near-term properties uh, in terms of an overall maximum build-out. So you can see that, um, and this is not, sorry, this is not representative of all 20 of the parcels. I basically picked every other one just to give you a sample. Um, but this is, the, the bottom line totals are all 20 parcels. This is a, a selection of 10 example parcels. So you can see the variation in building footprint, which is uh, relating to the parcel sizes, the number of residential units, of course, which is falling in line with those constraints as well. Occasionally you're hitting up to the maximum 16 units per acre. Uh, the ground floors are mostly commercial, except for the circulation up to the upper floors again. Uh, you've got all of that supported. So you're effectively uh, building out an additional 415 housing units in this maximum, this is the maximum number, again, that you can't, you can't fit. Well, you could configure the individual sites a little bit differently, depending on the designers and how they want to approach things. Uh, you could, I don't think there's many more units you could fit within the district in a maximized way. So it's gonna be in this range. The other thing, I, I guess I missed one caveat, and these are expressing exact numbers but don't let that mislead you. It, it, these are better expressed as a range. It's just easier for me to keep track of exact numbers with all these calculations and models that are occurring. Um, so this is somewhere around 400 units, call it. Um, the residential density across all those properties is 13 units per acre in this case, an additional 146,000 commercial square feet, which I think would be very difficult to fill in its entirety. Um, and then that's supported by a thousand uh, parking spaces overall. So this is, uh, again, the parcel analysis, the existing conditions of the district today. And then I have a, all of that, which I just outlined piece by piece, combined in one diagram here. So this is individual parcels, maximized build, all of the buildings, uh, building just as much mixed use development as they possibly can, uh, which is is possible under zoning if, it were if the recommended changes were adopted, 
but I, as I've mentioned in all the number of ways that I've outlined, uh, unlikely, possible, but unlikely. So just to frame this a little bit differently. So the total housing unit and the better expressed in the range, like I was mentioning, is, is anywhere from, I would say 200 to 620 units uh, as a range, what you could expect from that maximized build. And that's taking basically the, the nearer term parcels and then the cumulative of the total together. I, I heard an interesting fact, and I know that you all have asked me a lot for information like this before, but I attended a seminar last week on um, retrofitting suburbia, I think it was called, something along those lines. And a, and a very uh, prominent and well-known planner and urban designer in Boston named David Dixon, who works at a consulting firm called Stantec, mentioned just that uh, there are, it requires about 1,000 housing units within a five minute walk to bring a block of Main Street to life, is the way he framed it. Um, and I'm not sure exactly what bringing a block of Main Street, to Main Street to life means or how many shops that supports exactly. That's, that's not the detail that he brought to that quote. But I think that's helpful to give you an understanding of, of the parameters in terms of uh, housing units to support vitality in a Main Street. That's I, more, more detail than I think I've been able to bring you to date. So I thought that was helpful. Um, and then uh, across those 200 to 620 units total, you, you're, you will see uh, an affordable housing unit range, which is between 30 and 90 units, depending on where you are on that scale of overall units. So you will get affordable unit production with those uh, market rate uh, housing units. The total commercial space is between 77 and 220,000 square feet with all those ground floors as commercial space. Um, as I've mentioned, it's probably too much. Um, and then uh, I've already mentioned this, that the, the variation in zoning characteristics uh, changed from parcel to parcel. So I thought that was a good indication of a balanced set of ideas for the zoning. So just real quick, I'll do the build out as assembled and then we can get into a, a discussion. I'll, I'll stop talking. So the parcel assembly um, we agreed to with these eight uh, across the screen uh, and I've adjusted them based on our discussion last time. There's three parcels which basically are not combined in those eight. Um, which are on Rockwood Road and just off of Rockwood Road on Main Street here. And so this is uh, what the massing looks like if all of those assembled, if all of those parcels were assembled into effectively eight development sites. Um, and I think what happens here, the conclusions are that uh, you effectively, um, you do jump to a larger scale of development. I think that's sort of, um, may, maybe an obvious conclusion because you're getting larger parcels. So it's a, large, a larger scale development, which is uh, possible. Um, and, and so in so doing the maximum building footprint of 20,000 square foot becomes uh, more of a limiting factor than it would have otherwise been. You can see many of those parcel, many of the building footprints there are of that larger type, which is that 20,000 square foot building footprint. Um, but still, the maximum building height of three and a half stories and the maximum residential density of uh, 16 units per acre do show up as limiting factors on several of those properties as well. So again, it's still all of those characteristics are working in combination. The, uh, I think what's really interesting actually is this comparison uh, where you look at the two side by side uh, in terms of what, what's that maximized build out look like. If, all, if everything were to combine and everyone, if, uh, uh, developers started uh, buying up all the land, putting it together into these uh, mega projects. The, the net difference is about 30 housing units. So you get to 644 housing units across those assembled parcels compared to 616 on the current parcels. The residential density does get right up to that 16 units per acre across the district because it's easier to accomplish that on a bigger site. It's easier to get the, hit the density maximum the commercial square footage actually drops a little bit, curiously enough, because you, you are building out uh, fewer large building footprints, not as many large building footprints. So you don't have uh, many small footprints spread about the district. Um, so that actually comes down just a touch. Uh, and then the parking is, is in alignment, um, pretty, pretty close. But you, the parking becomes more efficient because the buildings are more efficient. Uh, and the sites are more efficient as well. So it's a little bit less parking overall. 
So it's not, um, I, I, I think we, we can talk about the scale and I'm sure that there are some uh, comments about the scale that we'll, we'll need to talk about this evening. Uh, but the overall numbers uh, from a parcel assembly to a current parcel configuration relationship are, are not that, uh, I don't think, dramatically different. Um, I, will, I will stop there because that's plenty to talk about. And then we can talk about the financial feasibility, unless the committee would rather me just power through this too, and then we can talk about everything. I, I think that's a good place to stop, Josh, and okay. before we get overwhelmed. <laughs> Um, I don't, I don't quite know where to start with comments. I mean, I, again, I think it's a great analysis. I think it's exactly what we were looking for. Um, I think again, it's, it's important to note that this is a maximum range as Josh mentioned, and the likelihood of reaching this density is, you know, is slim. And, you know, we're talking about a 40, 50, 60 year time range, not a, not a 10 to 15 year time range. So um, those are definitely important things to keep in mind. But again, you know, as planners and zoning change proposals, we're looking at a time range of, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. We're not looking at a time range of 10 years. So um, but I think those are definitely good parameters to keep in mind uh, as we as we look at this. But uh, the other thing I think it's the other parameter, which we haven't quite mentioned, but I've mentioned a number of times in the past that we're talking about planning for 20% growth in town over the next 20 years. 20% growth in town is another 2,400 people. That means we need to find somewhere to put 2,400 people in town, right? We can do that in the center of town where density is more appropriate, or we can do it on the farms and fields spread throughout the town. Um, I think if you look at the numbers that Josh is presenting, you know, the combined total is 615 units at one and a half people per unit. That's 920 persons. So that's not even half of the number of people that we're trying to plan for over the next 20 years. Right. So maybe, maybe another way of saying that is half of the growth we're expecting over the next 10 years, maybe a good place to put half of that growth is the center of town. Right. And then the other half of the growth will happen out in other parts of the town. So uh, just a, again, a couple different ways to look at the numbers that are being presented. Thoughts from the rest of the committee? I have a, jump in, I'll, I'll put you on the spot. I have a question, Josh, about the, the, the building height of three and a half stories. Yes. So I mean, we've talked about three and a half and we've talked about two and a half or, or, maybe, or maybe three. So if, if that building height changed, that assumption changed to let's say two and a half what the committee wanted to move forward on, it wouldn't necessarily change the commercial area option. It would change the residential units that would be available. That, that is correct. So yes, the building, um footprints that are shown here would, would roughly stay the same. The um, number of floors above them, of course, would be reduced by one, and therefore you'd reduce the overall residential units um, across the entire district. It would be, um, you know, uh, probably uh, 100, 100, depending on where you are on that range, you know, it'd be 100 of units taken off, something like that. Yeah. And I think it's also important to note that the current Zoning guidelines today allow three stories. Three story, right? Right. So, but that I just want to make the point that that's really what we would be playing with if we were changing the heights or the number of stories. Is is we're going to affect the residential unit that could be available? I think that's a very good point, Ed. Yes, agreed. Yeah, but I, I guess I've I've. This is maybe bringing back an old old point that I've tried to make a few times. The, the thing that um, worries me about these numbers is the amount of commercial square footage that shows up. And I think that that's the difficulty. And, and I think that one of the things that we were not able to address through the zoning recommendations because of um, the discussion that we've, we've all been having and having with the planning board and others uh, is, is how do you treat the, that ground floor space and, and I, I do feel like it's reasonable to maybe, uh, maybe not now if it's, if it's not uh, tenable, but 
in the future to consider the potential for some configurations where there are there is the ability to put some residential units into that ground floor to both add the ability to, because the residential units are, are going to carry these mixed use developments in terms of financial feasibility, and um, you, you will be reducing to a more manageable level the amount of commercial square footage that you're producing. So to, to that note, let's let's just review what we proposed for, for uh, commercial space, right? We, we added language requiring the ground floor of primary buildings to have no residential units and to be a minimum of 80% commercial retail space or appurtenant uses of the commercial retail space, right? So 80% of that 20,000 maximum square foot would be dedicated to commercial space. And, and what Josh's group is finding is, is that that 80% number is maxing out at a square footage of commercial space that seems infeasible for a rural community. Let me just try, I'm gonna to try to stop sharing and share this model with you just so you can see a little more zoom in picture if that works. Hey Rich, well, Josh is pulling that up. Um, how many housing units do we currently have within a five mile radius of Main Street? Uh. I, I don't know, top of my head. Does 267 sound correct? 200 what? 67? Uh, sure, it could be. Just thinking we have, uh, well, we have 40 Boyd's Crossing. There's 44, 64 there. So at... Um, a meeting house, there's 64 total units there, 40 at Boyd's, so that's 100. Um, you have the development, uh, well, John Whittleton's development up on the side. I'm trying to think how many that is in total. I'm sure it's about 200 and some units within a five-minute walk to town center. And Josh, your, your, your indication was that a thousand housing units would need to be within that same radius to make main street vibrant. Correct. That was the quote. Yeah. Gotcha. Thank you. And we'll have another, uh, 32 at Rockwood road, 36, 194 main. So there's another 64 units. Well, between River's Edge and Pin Oaks, you have almost 200. Yeah, but they're not a, I think you were asking about a walk, right? Kevin, was that a walk, a five minute walk? Yeah, that was yeah. intended for yeah. walking distance to yeah, Main Street. Distance. Yeah. All right, so I guess the- I'm sure if we ran some sidewalks down to River's Edge, Ed would be strolling into town center on a daily basis. <laughs> Believe me, people have already asked for that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And so if, if we say if we say we have 207 to 300 units, which it's a number worth confirming, Richard. Yep. Um, and we say that a combined maximum is another 600 units. That gets us to roughly a thousand units. Mm -hmm. at, so the, at maximum density over the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years, we're talking about having enough volume for a viable commercial district. So we'd have a glut of commercial that would not be able to be filled out even with a thousand people. Or to, right. And to, to say that Gary, if we reduced the number of commercial space and increased the number of residential units, that, that would be favoring that formula. Right. Yep. So hopefully you can all see this, my screen still, but I did try to just pull up the, the SketchUp model as the program we're yeah. using. And, and just to give you a little bit more detail that you couldn't see in the PowerPoint of, of how the massing of the buildings looks, uh, how the parking sort of is laid out and just gives you, gives you an idea of how the, how the look and feel. So what you're looking at here uh, is the library down in the, the lower right corner, um, Liberty Lane as it's coming up uh, to Meeting House 
Um, and then you can see some of the development that flows down Main Street towards Boardman, um, all within that view. I mean, part of the, so the value of this build out exercise is it has little di different pieces to it. I mean, one, it kind of gives you a, a max of that far end bookend of potential development. Um, but the presumption going into that is that there's a wastewater town sewer or some other water, wastewater treatment plant um, off-site to be able to support this development, which doesn't exist. So we have the wastewater treatment plant, but we don't have anywhere near the capacity to reach this build-out. So from that sense, it's less likely to happen because we don't have that infrastructure from the town side of it. Um, in place and then how much capacity or future capacity gets created would be a, a town decision as well. So um, now there might be developers that try to do a uh, wastewater treatment plant on their own, but those are quite expensive and they're not easy to carry the cost for those. So, so on one hand, I think this helps us get a better understanding as it relates to the sewer how that plays a part. And then also some of the things that we've been talking about as far as within the zoning recommendations, some of the proposed changes. Right, and Rich, Rich I, again, to, to say that another way, you know, it, some of the questions we've been getting from the public are what happens if we do put in a sewer plant and it gets maximized, right? So again, we now have the bookend study to say, hey, this is, this is as big as it's going to get. Right. That's, that's correct. Under, under no circumstances, really, could you get much more than, than what is shown in those diagrams and in those uh, ranges. Ed, were you raising your hey, hand? To just add on that. I'm sorry, go ahead. I just wanted to raise a point. Can't, can't we, I'll, I'll, say, I'll use the word manipulate, and I don't mean that in a devious way. Um, some of that retail space, if, if we were to designate some of those outlying yellow districts with a 40R that's um, purely residential, if that's how we would designate them, we reduce, we, re we reduce the number of commercial space while we maybe increase the number of residential or even keep it the same. So we could, we could reduce that to make it not look so overwhelming it's like, so see that, for example, that outlying one where the, the town property is, if that were a 40R was only residential, for example. Well, that's where, uh, Aaron, I know you came in just a little bit after we, uh, we got into Josh's. When I talked to Bill Rail at, the, at the DECD, who runs the uh, 40R program, he had mentioned that you can do sub districts, a defined sub district boundary within a parcel. So you might have, I uh, used the example of Nine Liberty Lane, but there may be a quarter of that that's 40R and the rest of it would fall under the conventional zoning uh, development standards. Or it could be, um, say, for example, um, over where Dunkin Donuts is, you know, maybe a part of that is another sub district with a higher density or where Ed was talking about the town parcel. They wanted to try to see to get rid of it um, and entertain a development development proposal. It could be broken up by uh, residential type. So it could be single family, two or three family or multifamily. I don't think we really haven't talked about two or three family. I don't think that's, probably where we'd be going to be, you know, we've most of the discussion has been around multifamily, but you could, those are one of the advantages of the uh, 40R. You could have multiple sub districts that are not contiguous. So that's uh, one thing that the town consider uh, if seemed appropriate. 
I think the one thing that Josh, what you said is probably would be good to segue to the financial piece is the amount of commercial space. Yeah. Uh, I think that was something that we really kind of talked about um, really all along is, is the market strong enough to demand that commercial space, even considering as part of a, you know, the mixed use. Yep. Yeah, we can jump into that. I, I would oh, just make on one, one comment. Oh, Excuse sure. me. I'm sorry. Just before you jump into that. Yep. Um, this is Susan. Um, did I'm I'm sorry. I may have misunderstood, but I think the one of the last things that was mentioned was you thought it might be too much commercial space. So we would reduce that down because, you know, it wouldn't get filled or whatever it is and increase the residential to get to that, you know, magic thousand person number. And then Ed mentioned maybe having some straight residential um, in the area. Isn't that incongruent with what we were trying to do in the first place, which is create only mixed use properties. I mean, if something's going to be straight residential, we could just leave it the way it is and let a 40 B come in. I, I, I'm not trying to be to be a pot stirrer. I'm legitimately asking the question. No, I would I would respond to that with you know the the goal of the committee is to to promote commercial development in the district, right? If if what we're finding that the best way to promote commercial development is to have residential units, then promoting residential units might be a way to promote a successful commercial district. I would also would add to that, that um, it's a good question. I don't think that you would want to do that in the center of the district where you are trying to get the ground, like the continuity of ground floor activity to occur. But I think where Ed was pointing out the town owned properties towards the, um, I guess, east side of Main Street towards the right of the slide on the screen, um, mm -hmm. those properties potential, those aren't, they are disconnected from the center of the district that you're trying to make active and walkable. They may have a, a more appropriate life as something that's more geared towards residential like Boyd's Crossing is next door. Um, but also, uh, I guess my, my suggestion would be for those particular parcels too, to, to maybe just leave them out um, and that it might not be worthwhile even from a maximizing standpoint because the town controls those properties. I mean, it's not like those are at risk unless you all agree that you're, you declare those as surplus and want to dispose of them as a town. And I just don't feel that that's where you where you all are at. So I would, I think that 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 basically would would trim down both the overall residential units we're producing, but it would also trim down the commercial that we're producing because that's you can see there's a lot of building footprints on those properties. Okay, great, thank you. That makes more sense. I appreciate that. Can I uh, if I could just piggyback on Susan's question really quickly, um, Josh. When we're looking at the limiting factors that you identified in the build-out analysis for the short-term properties, how many of those were capped by the residential limit of 16 units per acre? Uh, three of the eight. And okay. then the and if we were to in increase those to 20 units per acre with 40R, um, that wouldn't be a huge jump in total units, right? No, I, uh, no, it wouldn't be a huge jump in units. I think that, I'm just trying to think through whether or not you, in those cases, would be able to accommodate that prop. It, it might have to be that to accommodate those additional units on the site, since they are pretty much maxed out right now, you would have to consider in tandem uh, one of those um, ground floor commercial use sort of uh, compromises where, because you, you effectively don't have much more room to stick four more units per acre onto those sites, except for in the ground, like a portion of the ground floor. So that, mm -hmm. that just might be a part of what that thinking has to be. And the height is, is already capped out at three and a half stories. So yeah, those, those uh, except for one property, um, which is the property that's occurring at eight Liberty Lane, that's the, the eight Liberty Lane, I, that, whatever was up with that parcels configuration only got to three stories uh, mm -hmm. as a maximum, but all the others hit the three and a half. So let's real quickly get Thanks. through committee members thoughts here before we go on to the financial analysis. So um, Kevin, are you 
done with your thoughts for now? For the moment, thank you. Great. Eileen? Aaron, I have a question. Uh, who was that, Chris? Yeah. Yes. All right. So, so uh, Chris, can we, hold on a sec. Let's get through Eileen and Gary, and then we'll get to you. If that's I okay. apologize. Yeah. All right. Eileen? Uh, no, I have no questions. I thought this was really very elucidative and interesting and um, made some really thought out what we were looking to find out. Great. Gary, you good? I'm all good. Yeah, thank you. All right. That was quick. Chris? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wait, wait. You oh. didn't call on me. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Susan. Well, that's okay. Um, just just for clarification, we're also saying that, so when you're talking about the maximum building, you're going three and a half and, um, tw you know, 20,000 square feet and however many units based on those are the proposed changes to zoning. But that doesn't incorporate special permitting correct because those can still go bigger and taller with special permits am i right mm, i don't think so josh you so I, we are eliminating the special permit process because i thought that was one of the things that i had said was originally a couple you know a couple of months ago was it was if we go up to three three and a half stories and then you still can get a special permit and i said well would we consider taking the special permit part out of it? And they said, no, because if the right most perfect project came along and they needed, you know, 10 more feet, a half story more, whatever it is, we wanted to be able to allow that. So I just want to make sure, because obviously, like I've said to you guys before, my concern is that you never know what a planning board is going to do, right? Or a zoning board. When someone comes in and asks for a special permit, you know, the current board might be on board with the changes we're making, but a board in five years or 10 years or 15 years may not, and they may allow everything to be done, a special permit. Um, you have to plan for worst case scenario, I, I would think. Yeah. So I just want to clarify that yeah, Susan, if I we think... move forward with three yeah. and a half, it still is three and a half, and a special permit can be requested on top of that. Right. So, Susan, I'm looking, as you were talking, I'm looking through what our proposals were. And interestingly enough, we have enlist by special permit approval for everything other than building height. So building height cannot be increased above three and a half, even with a special permit. Well, that's the way the language was written, correct? Okay, great. Thank you. So actually, Chris, you, had a, you didn't get to Chris yet, right? Yeah, thank you. Okay. So uh, my question regarded the, the 40B projects that are existing, which are 194, Boyd's, and Meeting House. How many of those presently exceed the 16 per acre? So, uh, and what about, tw and 25 Rockwood, sorry, thank you. So 194 main, I think, is just two and a half acres, give or take. Yes. And that's so that would be so it's under that because it's 36. That would be 40. And Josh, do you have the acreage for in your spreadsheet for Boyd's and Rockwood? Uh just I want to say it was between six and seven. Yeah, I think I think you're right. Yeah, so Boyd's Boyd's Crossing is forty units on nine acres. Thank you. All right. So again, under. All right. So the, the village at Norfolk is thirty-five units on six and a half acres. Is that twenty-five Rockwood? Is that the real no. name? No. That's no. The village in Norfolk. Yeah. Yeah. The originally proposed, I don't know what it, the current numbers are for 194 Main was 75 units on three acres. No. No, that's incorrect. Nah, that's, it's, what it, uh, that's what it was. That, that's not what it is. That's what it was. Yeah. Right. Uh, so I'm, I'm talking real time. It's 36 units. I believe they're all, my point is they're all under. So I asked the question. 
What are we protecting ourselves from here? Well, I'd, I'd say that in another way, Chris. Uh, the Some of the proposals that we're discussing would encourage a higher density development than is currently going on in town. Okay, I, so that, I guess I who's in favor of that? I guess is my question. I well, that's, and, no, that's good it, to know. I appreciate that. I thank you very much. But but also more importantly, it it's commercial space that arguably you can't rent. Well, I think, I think that's what I would say that this, what we're trying to do is protect those commercial opportunities and that if residential development were to occur under 40B or other mechanisms, um, they will not develop commercial space for the reasons we've been talking about. And what we're trying to do is find the right balance between commercial and residential. I feel like that's been our, our um, we've been banging our head against that rock for a while now. Um, but but it's it is it is a challenge to get that balance right as as we'll talk a little bit more on the financial analysis too. Um, but that that's what we're that's what we're trying to preserve is a mixed use town center for Norfolk, not just a residential town center. Okay, I, I've struggled with that part of the conversation this evening in particular. Um, it, it seems like suddenly the commercial, which was the the driving factor behind this, right? Uh, is suddenly being pushed aside. So um, well, but Chris, I, I, let's, I don't, let's, I, I just want to clarify that point, right? It, the, the goal was not to create as much commercial space as we could, right? The goal was to create viable commercial district. Is that what we're doing? All right. Wait, but can I just clarify, and maybe I misheard it. Did Josh or somebody say in 50 years, we would qualify as a walkable downtown after you put in 1000 residential units. We, we, yeah, we don't know what the max build out time for this is, but yeah, I mean, there, as Josh mentioned at the beginning is there's an absorption rate for development, right? I mean, you so can't- I appreciate that. I'm just, it's a yes or no. Did he say that? I just want to make sure I understood it. No, Josh I did I, not say that. No, I did not say that. that, I, that okay. A, okay. Was I, that you, Aaron? It was Aaron. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think but, that... but is that what I want I want to know is that what I'm walking away with with the new zoning changes it's a yes or a no no we're we're, we're we're proposing changes to the b1 district that will occur over a period of time right and uh, professional history will tell us that that development, will not occur in five or 10 years. It will take a period, a much longer period of 20, 25, 30, 40 years. If, if even then, right? Because markets change. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. So were there other comments on this portion or should we move on to the next? Looks like we're good, Josh. Go ahead. Okay. And I, and I actually think just to maybe, because I can't, that was, I mean, good comments and I can't stop thinking about them a little bit, but I think that we've identified that there is a lot, we're producing a lot of commercial space. That's what we're talking about. And so um, in light of how much commercial space is being produced, that's why we're talking about um, the residential units, I think more so in this conversation uh, because there's, um, the, the numbers for the commercial space are substantial. So let's just get into the financial feasibility. Um, this this um, is related to the analysis I just showed of the maximum build out, but it's not quite the same. The, what I did for this was take a look at a hypothetical development program on just a one acre property. I'm trying to simplify our variables as much as possible. So it's easy to look at one acre. Um, I tested eight development program scenarios, including the current zoning on that one hypothetical one acre property. Um, what I did was assume consistent development, construction and soft costs based upon regional data that we use. Um, so we're, I'm not adjusting any of those basic assumptions for any scenario. So we're just trying to drill down onto if, if you vary the building program, if you add more residential, if you add more commercial, if you add more height, what, what is the impact for financial feasibility for those variations? Um, and then we also assumed consistent assumptions on the uh, 
uh, revenue side of things too. So uh, the retail rent, the housing sale, housing rent, all those assumptions are held consistent. Those are based on local data. So we had some information from a Norfolk housing production plan, uh, rental rates at 18 Union, rental rates at shops at Villages at River's Edge. Um, and so those are, I think, pretty good solid numbers to just build into this uh, model of assumptions. And then we've used the different scenarios to isolate variables and try to think about what the impact of each of the zoning characteristics are on feasibility. Um, and then in the end, because there are different ways that a developer can build out a project and then use that development asset as sort of a, a product, uh, and they, don't, they all have different sort of financial considerations, we, we've done a little bit of a cartoon version of whether or not a developer is selling the units as condos and holding onto the building and leasing the retail space to have a, a profit stream, whether they are selling the units and then selling the entire building as an asset to another developer or management company, whether they're holding onto the building, they've built renting the units, renting the retail and, and basically keeping it as an asset in their uh, management portfolio, or whether they're renting the units and setting it up as a, as a um, operating income stream and then can sell that as an asset to another uh, company. So those are, those are the four scenarios we've looked at uh, across those eight development program scenarios. And because it's, I've tried to summarize this, it's very difficult because I've got a lot of numbers in another spreadsheet, which I can bring up on the screen as well. But I'll start with this. Um, so those are the eight scenarios across the top. So you can see current zoning, increase the current zoning uh, height to, I know it's three stories allowed today, but I, I've always felt that the, because of the uh, height in feet that actually you'll, you only see two and a half story development in your current zone. So I'm saying increase that so you get three story height. You can increase it like we've recommended to a three and a half story height, then increase it increase the height to three story and increase the density to 16 units per acre, um, increase to three stories, 16 unit per acre and decrease the parking to one per unit. And then you've got the zoning recommendations, which is all of that plus the um, maximum building footprint and the uh, shared parking reduction, which I think is the last thing. And then I also approximated a 40 R density, just throwing in 20 units per acre and then I did a, what I call the maximum density is if you just took off all of the kind of like turn off density regulations and just let it naturally occur, um, which is different than the maximum build exercise I just did. And it's on this hypothetical parcel. And it, I didn't actually test drawing wise whether or not that actually works if you could fit that much, but I just wanted to see what it did for feasibility. Um, and then you can see the different development products here along the columns uh, in, in the scenario column to the left. So everything was negative across the board using the assumptions that I had. Um, and I think to me, I always want the, the building of the model that we're using to reflect reality a little bit. That's how I, I get a little bit of confidence in what it's telling us. And this first column of current zoning to me does that, which basically says, you're not seeing financial feasibility across any of the development uh, end product scenarios um, with your current zoning. And I think that, that to me is illustrative of what's happening on the ground today, is that you're not-, you're not so sorry. If I could jump in, sorry, real quick, just, just sure. to be clear, negative means not financially feasible, positive means financially feasible. Correct. And so, um, then when you start getting into things like increasing the, the height of to three stories, increasing the height to three, increasing the height to three and a half stories of the density, each of those become positive. And I'll explain a little bit what that positive sign means. So in all of the variables, which we looked at in the spreadsheet, um, I did not include land value. So what this is called is a residual land value analysis. And so we're basically plugging in all those variables and solving for land value. Land value is our missing variable. Um, and so land value, when it pops out of those uh, calculations, most of the negative items are actually negative numbers. So you have effectively what that's saying is after you've done all the development costs, you've got all the development producing revenue from rents, 
uh, you have no money to pay for land, um, which means effectively uh, it's, not, it's not a viable project because you usually need to acquire land or have that be a part of the considerations. Um, and the other, aside from that point, the other consideration is we're comparing, I'm comparing it to um, the current assessed value of one acre of land, which was, I used 15 Rockwood Road, which is in the district. It's a parcel, which is about one acre in size. Um, and it's, its land value is assessed at $169,500. That's just the land, not the building and land value. It's just the land value. So um, if, if the residual land value in our calculations is lower than $169,500, which is the average cost of an acre of land in the district, then that, that also is an indication to me of, of infeasibility. Um, and and it, assessed value is actually a, a low estimate of the land value. So I think it's safe to also say that you, you could assume that the actual value of the land is at least uh, one and a half times as much the assessed value, if not more, it probably is likely to be more. So as you march along these plus signs, um, so two, two thousand, or I mean, sorry, increasing the height to three stories uh, just reached over that one and a half, or not, didn't get to the one and a half times. It reached over the, the one time land assessed value. So that's a plus. But then it does get um, uh, more uh, positive as you move to three and a half stories. It gets uh, closer to the one and a half times the assessed value of that average parcel. Um, and then as you introduce the uh, density calculation here in the center column, it actually uh, reduces a little bit. So we, the overall land value from the residual land value analysis goes down a touch and it stays down a touch um, for the uh, maximum zoning with the, or sorry, the increased zoning with the density up to 16 and then the, um, all the way to the zoning recommendations it pops up again, but all of those are positive. They're just not as positive as the, um, as the number which was reached for the three story, I mean the three and a half story height. Then for the last two columns, which are the 40 R density of 20 units per acre and the maximum density, those uh, were both higher um, than the other figures for those positive numbers. And with the, the natural density being the highest, but the density, as I mentioned, might not be actually achievable. Just, just so you, you know it, the, the number, if you just do a straight, this is not um, doing a design exercise to try to fit this onto the site, but just by straight numbers, it, you could come up with a, a 26 unit per acre uh, density. And that density, um, yielded the highest residual land value. So that's what you see in those pluses. Each of those pluses, I think, under that scenario where you're effectively building the, building the development to have the developer hold it as an asset to rent the units as rental properties, the residential units, and to rent the retail space uh, as well. And I think that, that to me also matches with reality because I believe that's what's happening at 18 Union Street. So um, I, I, I think this, what the model is showing us is, is interesting. Um, and I can, let me just stop sharing. I'll bring up the spreadsheet just because that's what I've been looking at on the other screen. So you can all see it too. Okay, so here's the, Hopefully you can all see uh, an Excel spreadsheet now. So I won't, I won't go over this in its gory details too much, but the, the notion is here at the top is the development program and the variations in the development program. So they're all built out on a um, one acre property. Uh, then the variations in those different scenarios are across the top. So different building footprints, the different heights that were tested uh, flowing through the different residential and commercial sizes and the unit counts that come with those on the, on the one acre. And then we've got the, the development cost assumptions, which are held consistent, as well as soft costs, which are held consistent. And then the development value assumptions for retail and residential 
uh, both residential as a sale uh, product and residential as a rent rental product. And all of those assumptions uh, are held constant, um, but then vary, of course, depending on the size of residential uh, that's in the project that's described in the scenario. And then this is similar to the summary, which I just showed you in the PowerPoint slide. So all the pink uh, cells are the bottom line of this calculation, which is solving for, as I mentioned, the residual land value. Where those numbers are negative or below the um, assessed land value, which I got from the assessor's data, 169,500, uh, those are all showing up as pink. And then the, the highlights that are shown up in yellow are those that are above that value and thus indicating financial feasibility. So it is, uh, it is the building height, uh, I think, which is critical. Um, and then uh, I think what, what the model is telling us is that it's the recipe for success here appears to be building as much as you possibly can in as little building as you possibly can, because you, the, um, it does not help you to build out uh, a lot of extra building with the building costs for that construction and the management of that property uh, from a building standpoint. So you want to get as many uh, residential units into as little of a building as you possibly can. Uh, and that would cause your um, financial feasibility to increase. So the things that are helping in that regard are the building height, the um, parking requirements, reducing the parking requirements because that's those parking is also a construction cost. So the less you can build uh, the, the, to produce revenue generating development program, the better. The, um, the density requirement, the maximum density of 16 units per acre appeared to be working against us a little bit in terms of financial feasibility. So it was it was reversing the trend that the how that the sorry that the um, building height increases the building height increases were adding to financial feasibility and then when we introduced the density maximum it actually slowed that those positive gains down. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. I think those are the top top conclusions from this and the overall uh, summary of of this big spreadsheet. So, so is the model suggesting to you that we potentially could reduce the density but still create a positive outcome, which for some, for a good amount of people, maybe that feels better. So the number of 16, for example, might feel too dense, but but looking at the using the model, you could have a lower density and still have a positive outcome, which might be more palatable to people. Is is that what the model showing, Josh? I thought we just said higher density would be better. Yeah, I don't think the model's no. showing that quite exactly, Rich. I think that the model's showing that um, the what you probably want to do, if you were if you're just seeking financial feasibility as the end goal, which I mm -hmm. think it's, it's clear that 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 hasn't necessarily been completely what we're after, um, you would probably want to eliminate a density requirement, any a density maximum at all, because yeah. at, at, so smaller footprints, taller buildings, greater density beyond the sixteen. Just to clarify, correct. Correct. So, so when you, when I Thank did, you, run the, sure. When I did run the numbers for the 40 R and then what I was just calling like a naturally occurring density, which was even higher than a 40 R density, um, those, the financial positivity for those two was actually greater than any of the other scenarios. So um, I, I think it does indicate that what, what's, what would be sought in terms of a profit maximizing approach as, as I think Chris just summarized well, would be to have a uh, small footprint with a tallish building, three and a half stories, 
that has um, as many units as they can fit architecturally into that envelope efficiently. So, and that might be more, might turn out to be more than 16 units per acre. Um, but that, that, so that would be the sort of maximize, the feasible, feasibility maximizing approach. Um, How did that mesh with the feedback from the town when the study went out? Is that what you felt people were asking for? Could you, I don't know if I understand that question quite. So there was a survey that was sent out that was uh, asking people what they were looking for as far as the downtown. I don't remember a lot of people asking for taller buildings on a smaller footprint with a greater density. Yeah, yeah, I think I think that's true. I think that the um, this this is illustrating um, one of the dynamics which we've been talking about a lot in all these conversations is that the um, financial the recipe for financial feasibility is not perfectly aligned with the recipe for what the community has expressed as their ultimate desires for the town center. So to be so just to be clear, so I understand, this is more what the builder wants as opposed to what the community wants. This this analysis oh, yeah. this, this analysis is designed to uncover those dynamics of what makes a project most feasible. This is this analysis is not saying what we should or shouldn't recommend. This is informing our recommendations. So this what, what I would say here is what, what I think we've been trying to pursue all along is an overlap, an intersection in those two pi in, the, in a Venn diagram. We've got things that make a project financially feasible. We've got things that the community has expressed as desirable in town center. And I believe there's an overlap between those two things. And that overlap is what we've been trying to uncover this whole time in a way that creates financial, financially feasible projects that the town can get behind and really enjoy and would make the town center what they want. I think, that, I think that I think that what the um, what the financial analysis shows us is that the the zoning recipe which we've recommended is not the the um, profit maximizing slash financially feasible maximizing approach. I think there there is more we could do to maximize the feasibility of our approach, and I think we've worked. So what I'm I guess what I'm saying is it to me what it illustrates too is one of the things I've said before is that the zoning recommendations I do believe present uh, a compromised position between what developers might want and what the community is saying they desire as well. It might not be, uh, we're, we're still talking about the um, fine tooth refinements of that compromise, but I think that this, where our recommendations are at is not a um, full financial feasibility, all, all engines go approach. Right, so Josh, picking picking up on that explanation, which I think is a, a good summary of what you went through. I mean, if we if you were to go back to your negative positive slide, yes, right, and again, a lot of that you 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 you, you had a number of different scenarios in there, but if if we were to take a half a story away or decrease the density from sixteen to fourteen to twelve, or um, decrease the maximum building size, right? The, the opposites of what makes a more viable development. As soon as we start taking one of those three legs away, we start becoming unviable financially, right? I think, I think that the, um, what's tricky in this presentation in, my, in the, these types of analysis is that there's not necessarily a magical threshold between viable and unviable, which is, which is universal. It, it will vary by developer and by property. Yeah. And so, so I've used a, um, a shorthand for that, which is based upon the assessed value of a, of a comparable property in the district times one and a half, which I think is a reasonable approach in terms of um, that, defining that threshold. But that threshold is not an exact science. And, and so I think every, everything you do, if you were to move down the scale, I guess uh, on this chart that's on the screen, you from left to right uh, towards the left is more, you know, pr pr uh, presenting more restrictions on feasibility and to the right is presenting less restrictions on feasibility. For every restriction you 
uh, put onto feasibility, the likelihood that it will work for a given developer on a given property becomes less. Um, what what I've I've seen in a similar analysis for other um, districts um, and other parcels where we've done this sort of approach, uh, many more of these types of um, negatives and positive, like we see a lot more positive figures pop up in this type of analysis. So to me, it's already expressing that there's a pretty narrow um, suggestion of success here uh, under some pretty uh, pretty de defined constraints about how the how the product needs to be positioned in the end for the development. All right. So let me let me ask that question a different way, um, and then we'll get to some of the other board uh, committee members. If I mean, one of the goals of this study was to see if we went too far towards the developer side um, and uh, too far away from what the community wants are, right? So if, if we're trying to achieve that balance in that Venn diagram that you mentioned, like, have we achieved that balance? Or, you know, what, if, if I'm the public and I'm saying, that's great, I, but I don't quite understand it or I don't believe you. I, I don't understand why we can't achieve a financially feasible building with, uh, with a three or two and a half story building height. Yeah, I think it's, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if I, if I can make the call that the, the, that balance has been achieved. Um, I, I think that the, what, what the, both the build out analysis and this financial feasibility analysis indicate to me is that we are, um, we are in a balanced position in, in very many ways, both in terms of feasibility and the zoning characteristics themselves. Um, if, if the community is still um, uh, very apprehensive about the types of future that this, this, these analyses are pointing to, um, then we should continue to talk about ways to, to build that comfort level um, and expand it. The, uh, but I don't think that it's the case here where, where I see clear variables indicated that we could uh, reduce density, reduce height, um, reduce parking or increase parking requirements. All, all of those things I think are already indicating that feasibility is narrow and a tough road and not, and I don't see runaway success in what any of these figures are showing us. A good answer. Thank you. Uh, why don't we run around? Ed, you got any questions? I, I guess I just want to make a comment about something you you answered to Chris Henry about you know the, the surveys. Didn't didn't the town surveys indicate they wanted a higher height? Yeah, there was um, there was indication. I think. And I, if you give me a minute, I think I can actually bring up what they were. But yes, there, I think the three-story height was indicated. The, in the workshop which we held, three and a half stories was indicated as a height people were willing to accept. And that, that showed up strongly in the workshop. It showed up less, less so in the overall survey, which had many more responses than the workshop did have attendees. Let me see if I can just grab that. But that was also done with the premise that we would be achieving some of the larger asks in terms of quality of life additions and commercial offerings. Um, if that was the trade-off, this was the appetite that people had, right? That's how it was framed? Yes. But yeah. I, 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 think that, so, Kevin, I, I think it's also important to note that the way that survey was framed wasn't a comprehensive, you know, take questions six, seven, eight, nine, and 10, and consider them all in combination. They, they were all individual items, right? Building height was taken into consideration in terms of building height. Maximum footprint was taken into consideration with maximum footprint, right? So um, as is natural, you know, in a public setting, you can't, you, you can't sort of combine all of those questions to achieve a, a, you know, a balanced Venn diagram, right? So 
you know, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is, is the survey, the survey provided raw data, which the committee interpreted, right? Understood and agree. Um, but, you know, as a layman in town who is asked to fill out a survey and question one is, what kind of businesses do you want to see in town? And then question three is, how high of a building would you like to see? That natural connection is likely made, right? Maybe. Well, this is just Martha. I just have a quick question. Um, to Kevin's point, can you, can you, Josh, share how, what were the, was it a multiple choice for the height? It's been so long, I can't remember. Like, was it a range or was it two feet, three feet, four feet? No, we did it by stories. So it was, um, we asked if one to two story would be a good fit for town center, would two to three story be a good fit? three to four story and then four story or more. So that's how we framed it. Um, and so, so how, did the, you how did you aggregate two and three and three and four? Did you separate those out? Did you create an average? How could you to range? I guess that, that I'm not, I'm just a little concerned, Erin, that you're like, oh, we couldn't figure out a way to ask those. I'm an evaluator. Yes, you could. Uh, and then to say, we took it upon ourselves to interpret what we think people meant when we gave them this parsed out survey and we put the gestalt together for them. And now two years in, we're getting financial feasibility and build outs and they don't look great. I've spent a lot of time, maybe much to people's dismay, engaged in this process and I feel disappointed. Martha, I'm not sure I understand the concerns it, 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 with, I mean, we've, we've been working to get to this point. We're here. Um, I know. I appreciate that, but I just guess I don't understand from a process perspective, why we didn't get this kind of information 18 months ago when we have asked for it, we have it formally in writing to rich. So I'm just, frustrated that I spent all of this time for maybe a not so rosy picture, but you wanted me to vote on it a year ago with no data. That's frustrating as a citizen. Troubling. And, and I'm looking at my screen. There's two, four, six, eight, 10, 12 of us on this call. One of them is Andrew. In a town of how many people? This is why. And I will say this is my backyard. That is why I'm invested. And I came to Norfolk and I left Franklin because I like the center that my kids can ride their bikes to safely. And they hang out at Walgreens and Scylla's. And that's nice. So I just am frustrated that I've been so involved really buying into this great walkable downtown. And then it turns out Maybe not, or I'm going to be dead by the time it comes. So I'm feeling frustrated as a taxpayer. I think, um, this is Susan. I think what I would like to add um, or expand on with what Martha is saying is that we spent a lot of time, you know, possibly because of, you know, the feedback from the advisory board and the select board and, and various boards from the work that was done the first time, but we've spent a lot of time prior to that. And since then debating about parking and height and square footage and density and what we're going to do. And then two months before we're supposed to present it to the town, we find out that none of those options are, are viable. The only financially viable is to max out at, at three and a half, stories and max out the density and decrease the parking so why did we spend all of that time debating about which how we were going to put it forward if the only option to put forward is those options because that's the only thing that's going to be financially viable in the first place we i feel like we wasted a lot of time you know that, that's just my opinion um and i'm and i'm not finger pointing i'm not blaming anyone i'm simply saying if we if we I'm guessing we didn't realize because we hadn't done this financial vis um, viability analysis 
So I understand that. And I'm, so again, I'm not blaming anyone. I'm just trying to point towards the frustration. I mean, I think we spent an entire meeting debating back and forth about height and parking that that meeting wasn't necessary. If, if we find out, you know, a few months later that it doesn't matter what we want. It doesn't matter what the town wants. The only thing that's viable is three and a half stories with one parking spot. (laughs) So I think that's going to lead to some frustration. Um, And I can certainly understand Martha's frustration. This is, you know, literally her backyard and she's, she's been at almost every meeting. And if she's not, it's because she's at a zoning meeting. So I, I can't imagine. I mean, we're on the board. We signed up for this. These are people who are calling in and listening because they care and they want to make sure they have all the information when they vote. So I think that's going to lead to some frustration. I know I'm frustrated. Sorry, go ahead, carry on. I I would like to address, I mean, I appreciate the frustration um, that I'm hearing, but I would like to address a couple misconceptions. Um, First off is that we, we have done a very similar build out analysis and parcel analysis that was presented to the B1 committee uh, probably more than a year ago, maybe, I don't know when it was, May or June of last summer, uh, in the lead up to the original recommendations. Uh, so this, this analysis has been revisited is what, what it said in the agenda for this evening. And so it has been revisited at the request of, uh, of the conversations that have been occurring. So this, this is, this, the, the recommendations had the benefit of this type of analysis. I think the analysis has made clear to me and hopefully to all of you some of the dynamics that we've been coming back to again and again. And I don't think that it, that anything in this analysis forces the town's hand in any direction. I think what it does is provide you more information to act how you would like to. And if, if the frustration is that it seems like all I'm saying to you is that you can have something that, only, the only way to have your walkable town center is to have something that you don't want, which is perhaps you're feeling too big or too dense. Um, you, I think you can approach the zoning recommendations however you would like. What I'm telling you is that there's just a chance then that you will not get a developer on the other end who's receiving it accordingly or how you would like to. That's, that's all I'm pointing out. I think that the, um, the zoning recommendations you can, you can proceed with um, how you'd like to. Uh, and, and I also think that the, uh, what, I, what I've seen in the analysis is actually, to me, hopeful and optimistic because I think it, it showed um, in a little more specific terms the, uh, a path forward for a feasible development, which I didn't think was, was perhaps represented by the zoning recommendations as we were coming to them. I, I was still, uh, I w- was potentially thinking that we might see the requirement to go even higher or denser to hit that financial feasibility threshold. But, but I think that I thought it was promising that the zoning recommendations, which we've been talking about so much, have that window of opportunity. Um, we, could, we could narrow it more uh, and respond to the frustrations that we're hearing uh, this evening and have heard before. Um, but I, I would just like to state that all of this work has been based on data, on analysis, on very thoughtful considerations, research, uh, and an understanding of of what has been shown to you in great detail this evening. So we are revisiting these things at your request. We are not doing them for the first time. Uh, Just one more question. Uh, So in regards to the the meeting that you said was uh, attended by people for the, the discussion and you were weighing that versus the survey, how many people returned the survey versus how many people attended that meeting? Do you know the numbers? I think it was like five, wasn't it? Versus 500? On um, April 11th, 2019, we held a community workshop, which was attended by 25 attendees in the community. There were over um, 500 I think it was 540 survey responses. Um, so I but, guess that's my question is why would you weigh 25 versus the heavier than the, than the 500 responses when we're trying to interpret what the town was trying to envision? Chris, I'll, I'll jump in there for history on the committee conversations. I, 
you know, I, the the recommendations that the committees come to and are, are still being discussed are a result of you know years of conversation, right? The the inputs of the survey, the inputs of uh, the town meetings, the inputs of meetings with individuals, the inputs with public comment at all of the meetings. It's all been taken into account. It's all been taken into account with the goal of the committee, which is to promote commercial development in the B1 district. And, uh, you know, as in order pr to promote commercial development, maybe it's not fully in line with all of the goals and desires of the community. I mean, that's what we're here to ferret out. If, if, if what it's gonna take to create a commercial financial district in the center of town isn't palatable to the town, well then that's what we've discovered in the two years. But again, that, that's still a productive use of time, right? We can, we can say that, hey, we looked at making downtown more commercially viable and it wasn't, it wasn't acceptable to the public. If, if that's where we end up, then that's, that's where we end up. But, you know, that's a, that's a possible outcome of this B1 committee study. It certainly is. Um, but again, I think as, as what our goal is, is to, is to come up with a set of recommendations that we believe promotes commercial development. And that's where we are. And that's what we need to take forward. And and hopefully we find that right balance point, as Josh mentioned, between what's necessary to promote commercial development and what the community wants. And it gets approved and it gets built in 10 to 15 years. That, that would be great, too. That would be a great outcome from this scenario. Um, yeah, I agree. I, 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 do, I struggle less with the uh, with the timeline and more with the justification for making the the changes in the first place like the uh if in fact your goal is to promote the commercial development i have to say earlier in the evening you seem pretty comfortable in writing it off and increasing the density residentially so so i i struggle with the sort of juxtaposition that you seem to have of this is about commercial development but if it's not viable, let's go residential. And I, and, and I Chris, that's feel not like what I'm that, that's not okay. necessarily, well, okay, but I'm just telling you what I'm hearing, okay? Right. And I'm just one concerned citizen uh, that that seems to be the feedback that I've been hearing is that, you know, the, this is what it takes in order to make this project financially viable. Uh, and, and if we have to, you know, fiddle with building height and density and, all of those things in order to make it palatable for a builder. Well, huh, frankly, that's what we got to do. Uh, and and if you were making that argument and I was getting that commercial base on the other side of it, I think you'd have a stronger argument. Uh, but when you say, ah, I'm willing to just let it go for some more residential, I argue that I don't know that's the vision that I had or many people had for the downtown when they filled out that survey. So I just say, I, I think it's worth taking a minute to look back at that survey and say, does this mesh with Joss's plan for the downtown, right? Uh, I, I understand this is what it takes, Josh. And I, and I don't, and I credit Josh for uh, when something doesn't necessarily fold his way, he still lays out the facts and says, this is what it is. So I appreciate that. Uh, but I, I have to question whether his vision for downtown Norfolk meshes well with Norfolk's vision of downtown Norfolk. But that's, like I said, just me, one guy. Chris, can I, can I, I just don't want to leave, have you leave this conversation with something that's um, been mischaracterized a little bit. So the earlier discussion about the commune, the commercial square footage was not that we're reducing, we're throwing away commercial square footage and preferring residential uses. The build out analysis identified what is very likely to be a large surplus of commercial space on that maximum build out. So what we're talking about is less opportune locations where you might not want that commercial ground floor anyhow, like at the very ex outer extent of the district that's on town owned property and saying that maybe we shouldn't show commercial square footage on that ground floor there. Maybe that should not be developed as a property at all, or maybe if that were to be developed in the future, it's a town-owned property. 
it could be developed as residential only if that's what suited the town. That's, that's entirely different in which we've stated now in this meeting more than once than the way you just characterized what you have heard. So perhaps you need to listen a little closer for the way that we're talking about these things. Josh, I'm doing the best I can to try and keep up here. Uh, I, I guess I'll defer to you. You are the professional. Um, thanks for your input. Chris, we need to we need to move on with uh, the committee's comments real quick here right, on the feas feasibility study. Ed, do you have anything you want to follow up on on our feasibility well, conversation? That's the point. I mean, when we, we look at this and talk about it, I think there's an assumption that we're talking about a gigantic all of a sudden, all these parcels downtown are going to build up three and a half stories and we're going to have a metropolitan downtown. I mean, if we looked at this and we just selectively zoned with, you know, a couple of the parcels just to, as I almost call it as a test and see if we can attract something in, because we know all those yellow ones are already developed. They're not going to change tomorrow. So, so we have a short-term target of the undeveloped ones. If we can do something to, to encourage some commercial development there, that's not changing the, the character of the town if we change two parcels necessarily. And isn't that a start? Isn't, isn't that how we want to maybe look at this and not give the impression that we're building Manhattan downtown in Norfolk? Thanks, Ed. Gary, you got anything to add to the feasibility? No, I, I appreciate the exercise and um, pretty, pretty, pretty enlightening. So thank you, Josh. Eileen. Well, I certainly understand Martha's frustration with maybe how long it took to get to the point of the feasibility study, finan the financial feasibility study, because to me, that was very interesting to see that laid out very specifically. And, and again, thank you, Josh, for that information. So I, I kind of get what Martha was saying about that, because all along, I think we've been trying to make decisions and recommendations, but not knowing Again, we talked to the developers, but not knowing kind of what it took to get to a point where they're going to decide to develop a piece of property in, in an appropriately Norfolk way. So I guess my question to everybody else, and especially Martha and Chris, would be, well, what's the alternative that we have? So if we make recommendations based on the financial feasibility of developing these properties, or we don't, and if we don't, what do we get on the other side of that, right? Aren't we all concerned about what comes if we don't do anything at all? So we need to take this and move with it because if we don't do anything at all, we're gonna end up with a town that nobody wants to live in. So that's my point of view. Thanks, Eileen. Kevin. Uh, so bigger picture as well. Um, I understand the frustration from Martha and Chris and far be it for me to say something that might discourage two of the most involved five people in town from continuing to be involved. Um, but I, I really feel like we're, we're kind of condemning people before decisions are even made. Uh, we have these studies that have been presented to the committee uh, without the committee having the ability to identify the path we want to take yet. I mean, we could do something that goes against some of Josh's recommendations, despite his professional background, just because we have a better feeling for what the appetite of the community is. Uh, so I would like to go through the process of digesting everything that we've heard tonight, um, kind of solidifying some more defined direction as a committee, and then kind of going through the criticism of how the path looks, uh, what we use to get there, and how we determine this is the best path for the community. I mean, I can tell you back in that time where we were trying to get feedback from people, that 500 people we got, we were really happy about that. I mean, we were to the point where we were trying to corner people in the parking lots at soccer games just to get some insight as to how people feel about this thing. So, you know, being involved in town government here for the better part of five years, that was the most input that we've ever gotten for anything um, sub a school related town meeting issue. So um, I, I do think it was directional. I, I don't think it was a complete vision at all. Uh, but I think that we were working with the best of what we could get from the community at the time. So I look forward to the further conversations about how we're going to move forward with this and also uh, any discerning comments that might come to uh, get to a better place as a whole. Thanks. Susan? <clears throat> couple of things. Um, one, do we have, is there any appetite at all for um, 
presenting another survey in the sense, and, and, I, and I don't want to go back and repeat work. That's not what I'm trying to do. Um, I'm not sure how it was presented the first time because it's been so long. Was it, was it on Facebook? Was it only, you know, through the mail? I, I wasn't sure. Posted on the government website. The reason I ask is because would it be feasible to say, do another survey, but a quick one, maybe it's only on Facebook, maybe it's only on the town government websites and say, with the knowledge of what is financially feasible, what, what would you see? What would you like to see? Meaning let them know that to get a com walkable commercial downtown, here's what needs to happen. We need to have a specific amount of density. Would you agree to this? Would you agree to this? How likely are you to come to town meeting and vote? Um, you know, would you also vote for an expansion um, of our schools, you know, the, the expansion on Freeman, things like that, because maybe if it's worded in a different way, it would help us to sort of narrow the focus. And I'm and I don't mean a very in-depth survey where it takes, you know, months to compile the data. I'm just mean something very quick and easy um, posted to a few of the different groups on town websites and on Facebook and things like that. That's question one. And question two is, if developing these properties were not economically feasible for developers under our current zoning laws and haven't been for a while, why did they buy them in the first place? Because, you know, some of these parcels have been owned by the same people undeveloped for, for 8, 10, 12, 15 years. So why'd they buy them if they didn't think they could develop them? Or is it that they bought them with the intention of not developing, developing them anytime soon? I guess that's my question, because it wouldn't make sense to purchase a property that you can't financially develop. Does anyone have any you know, insight on that? I mean, I know that Kevin has spoken to a couple of the owners of the properties. I'm just trying to gauge if it's, I, I'm wondering if it used to be financially viable, but now it's not. Because these zoning changes have been in effect, the zoning regulations have been in effect for a long time. So it means they bought them knowing what the current zoning laws were. I, I, I can't imagine someone buys property without doing a market analysis before they buy it. That, that would seem like bad business to me. So does anyone know? I could offer a couple observations that uh, it's difficult to generalize across all developers and what they do with their land holdings, of course. But it, the properties in Norfolk Town Center are strategic properties um, and, and developers have known that. They see that the commuter rail stop is there. They see that Norfolk is attractive as a community um, and that the town center is an attractive place. Um, many of the developers um, that purchase these types of properties uh, have uh, the ability to hold on to these properties for the long term. So they're, they're looking at a, a property in their portfolio, which uh, they don't need to pay much attention to and that it sits there. And when the opportunity is right and when they have the right uh, time and, and availability and their own staff and development uh, uh, leverage to then go ahead and move that property forward when the time is right. Um, so I think that's, that's a lot of what's going on here. And in, in the circumstances of some of the properties, they, they may have, uh, and I think we, we know in some of the cases, in fact, there, there are valuable leaseholds going on as well. So that's a consideration. Um, but but they are, these are, um, developers are long-term thinkers and long-term strategic players. So they, they um, have identified these as long-term opportunities and are willing to take that. All right, uh, Josh, thank you for presenting those studies tonight. I I think it's a lot of information that we've been looking for, uh, as has been mentioned for quite some time. Uh, it's good to have in our in our pocket. Um, I think. Yeah, I'd like to ask a question um, of Josh of the of the five hundred surveys. Just to go, but sorry, not to rehash the five hundred surveys, but forget the some forget the specifics about building heights and square footage and all that. Was there a general feeling of the 500 surveys that people did or did not want development in Norfolk Center? I, I think I would generalize it as that the majority want a vital, walkable town center. Uh, and I think that's sort of the, the generalizable, agreeable aspects of it. 
I think there, there was variation on specifically how that's achieved. And then I, I will say that there were voices in the survey responses that um, mentioned things like Norfolk Town Center is just fine the way it is. We don't need higher taxes, those sort of sentiments. So the, those, it was not all positive. Let's develop this walkable town center. Um, uh, but I would say, I think I would characterize it as the majority would agree they want a vibrant walkable place. Thank you. Yeah, I'm gonna jump in here too and add, you know, the, the meetings themselves were recorded. They're available. Uh, our conversations of those meetings were recorded and are available. Um, so uh, you know, I, I, I think if, if folks wanna go back and revisit what those conversations were, I believe that's there for, for their perusal. So um, if, if we need help finding that, let's, let's go through Rich and, and point people in the right directions. But you know, those, those conversations were there, so. All right, so we, we've got a few other things we need to get through on our agenda tonight. Um, sort of next steps. Uh, and uh, we haven't really said it out loud, but I think we're headed down a road where I don't know that we're gonna have a recommendation for the fall town meeting at this point. Um, we should probably have a conversation about whether we want to go with a 40 R district for the fall town meeting and then kick off the zoning guidelines for uh, a future date, something like that. Uh, but the warrant is, if not already open, open soon. So our, uh, our timing is, is running out on that one. Um, it's probably worth kicking around tonight uh, if we want to try and get something on the, on the fall town warrant or not. Uh, picking up after that, you know, we, we have some other things, you know, do we want to talk about a MAPC presentation at town meeting? We've talked about it a number of times. Uh, is this the right time to make that happen? Um, you know, maybe that ties into Susan's request for another survey. You know, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe the, to the presentation to the town, you know, acts as that survey because we will certainly get feedback. Um, uh, we do, uh, we do owe the planning board an update. Again, there are, our driving board for this scenario. So um, I have been keeping them up to date as the uh, planning board member for this committee. Uh, but I think it's time uh, for us to start collecting our thoughts and putting together a, a, an updated recommendation for the planning board. Um, uh, I was hoping, uh, I mean, I, I, I think it's a little bit short-sighted to say we could have some of those conversations tonight based on the fact that we just got a whole bunch of new information. Uh, but I think, you know, coming out of our next meeting, we need to, we need to have the framework of our updated recommendations to take those and, and start discussing them with the various boards and, and folks in town that, that need to see them. So, uh, you know, with, with that being said, I, I don't know that it really is worth voting about putting something to the warrant uh, for this fall, but let's, let's make that a topic of discussion uh, for the committee members here. Did, you know, at, at this point, it, does one of the committee members want to make a push to make some sort of a recommendation for the fall meeting? Are you talking in the form of a warrant? Uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, it would be a warrant recommendation. Oh, well, we, our recommendation would go to the planning board and the planning board would be making the recommendation to, to the, the select board. So, you know, our, our committee recommendation goes to the planning board. So I guess the, the real question is, is are there any recommendations coming out of the committee to take to the planning board for the fall town meeting? Hi, Susan here. Um, I'm not, I'm not saying this in the sense that I think we're absolutely ready to go to fall town meeting. However, I guess it's more about if we put it off for another almost year, nine more months, are we going to accomplish anything else? I mean, and I don't mean that in a, in a negative way. I'm, I'm trying to be as positive as possible. If we know what the financial viability is and we know we have the information from the survey we have the build out are we just discussing whether or not we want to designate a lot 40r 
because it looks like we're going to put forth the three and a half stories, the, the parking, the density, the way that it is, because that's what is financially viable. And then just let the chips fall where they may. And, and like we said, you know, I, I can't remember who I was talking to about it. If the town votes it down, then we have our direction in essence. So that would be where we would be at. They would vote yes and we would move forward with the changes that we have or we would they would vote no and we would stop all attempts at changing the zoning and just let it be again so, i'm not trying to be a troublemaker i'm trying to say that i think we should just go ahead and move forward what well, what Susan, could yeah, so four I'll, months I'll of debating do for us I, I just think at this point it's a matter of the process that we need to go through in order to get the the warrant items approved right we've got a We've got to get it. We've got to come up with what they are. Uh, probably not going to happen in the next month. We've got to present them to the planning board. The planning board needs to digest them and vote on them. It's got to go from the planning board to the select board, uh, probably through the advisory board. Right. So, I mean, what's that process is at least three or four months, right. Which puts us out of this warrant uh, just, just for the formality of the process. I mean, okay. Could we could we potentially expedite that process? Uh, maybe. It, we tried it in the past. It didn't work so well. Okay. So then, yeah, I thought you were asking if we wanted to move forward with um, being on the November warrant. If if it's not possible, it's not possible. I just don't know that we should spend a ton more time debating everything back and forth. I think if we're going to wait for spring, then we should hopefully strive to say be done by January and, and just be ready to go. Um, and not have, I guess what I'm trying to say is I don't want to have, I would not think that it would be the right course of action to have six more months of meetings, just about debating the changes. The changes are going to be what the changes are going to be. And then we should just move forward with the process of getting them on the warrant. Um, versus continuing to have meetings to discuss it. Yeah, I, I, but, that's, but again, that's just my opinion. Um, you know, if everybody else feels we still need to discuss changes, you know, in depth, then certainly I'm, I'm on board for that as well. I thought we were just, you know, giving our opinions on it. No, I think you're, I think you're hitting a lot of the, the right notes here, Susan. I think you're right. Um, I don't know that we need another year of discussion I think we're, I think we're getting ready to make some recommendations, and I think we can do that in the next month or two. I think we then, you know, execute the formal process, and somewhere in that formal process, there's got to be some public education. We're not going to go straight to town meeting with these proposals, right? There's there's going to need to be some upfront education and meetings to do that. Um, you know, we'll have to talk about whether we want Josh and the MAPC involved in that, or or exactly what that process is. So. But I, I think you're absolutely right. I think in the next month or two, we need to make our recommendations. And then that the next year is spent executing the, uh, those recommendations uh, as best we can. If I could just throw some some timelines into that, uh, Aaron, uh, the select board did vote to open up the warrant for the fall town meeting at the meeting on August 18th. And the warrant is expected to be closed on September 10th. Um, that's for the fall time meeting that's going to happen on November 17th. So uh, it's my position that we are well outside of the feasibility of being able to have something to present uh, to the town at the fall town meeting. That being said, I would fully support a presentation or a status update of where we are today to be given at fall town meeting. And as you had suggested, have that be the trigger for a more pointed and directive survey to be given out to the community. Um, as a follow-up to that presentation uh, to guide us through uh, the beginnings of an established presentation for the spring. I agree with Kevin. Um, I think that that's likely the way things need to proceed at this point, knowing our short time frame. But what I, I think really needs to be expressed to the community is uh, if we don't make these changes, what's the alternative? They have to understand that we're not doing this just because we're doing this, is that what's the alternative if we don't do anything? Yeah, I, I agree. 
I agree with Susan's original pretense that I, I don't think we need to keep rehashing the specifics of what, what needs to happen if we feel comfortable with them. But I think we do need time. And I think we should be talking about how do we inform the public? How do we get the public more engaged? We can't walk into a town meeting with such a complex issue as this is and think that they're going to understand it in you know a five minute here's a, here's the warrant how do you want to vote on it it's i think that's ludicrous i think we need a a year of public relations and public outreach and community involvement more so than we've done right. thank you ed thank Aaron. you ed and i agree with that Aaron, may, I, may i offer a couple comments sure Rich, go right so um, i think it would be good for the next step is to check in with the planning board, give them, you know, opportunity to hear Josh's findings for what we have so far, and then um, discuss, get them to have a probably more fuller appreciation of where the committee is at so far before uh, going off and then solidifying the recommendations. Because I know some of the comments when, uh, you know, some of the things that came from last fall, there was some hesitation and then reluctance from the planning board to support some of those recommendations. In point of fact, I think we were, we being collective, that uh, they made a hat, they might have quite frankly had a negative recommendation from the planning board. So I think it's important for the committee doing the work to get a good, a better sense of, uh, you know, with the planning board, at least knowing where they stand on some of the recommendations before you home in on them a little bit more, especially the fact that um, despite the one bite of the apple, it could it could very well be just one bite of the apple if the planning board doesn't recommend some of these. So we talked about bundling things and unbundling. Well, if it comes out with no favorable recommendation of planning board, you can't come back for two years, as uh, we just saw earlier yeah. this spring at the annual town meeting, that zoning recommendation um, that was the citizen petition, it got voted down, and so that's out for two years. It's just important to, in the context to, to understand that as going forward. Um, and then I guess the one, the one comment I want to um, say about where we're at process-wise, I understand the frustration. I mean, the original purpose of this grant that we, or at least I put together on behalf of the town, was to look at the zoning bylaws in relation to the vision of the town for town center. So it really started from 1992 master plan and then came into 2007 for this walkable downtown. And walkable downtown has a different feel for many different people, as Martha suggested. You know, her vision is going to be different than mine or yours. So um, to get to that, that's where that's not that's subjective in a way. And we're trying to get to that. So, I mean, I understand it's, it's taken a long time, but and there's frustration along the way. But I don't think it's necessarily has been wasted um, by any means because we have learned a lot more about the zoning bylaws and if nothing comes of it, which Eileen was talking about, and we don't move forward as an option, and we don't get some of the things that people want to see in town center, some of the uses, then at least we have a better way to answer that question. Well, how come and why not? Well, if it's not feasible um, for a variety of different reasons, we can start to answer those questions um, a little bit more definitively. Um, because of what we've learned so far along the way. I mean, I can tell you, as we talked about back quite some time ago, Dunkin' Donuts is one site, for example. I don't think the zoning was going to really tip the scale for him as far as development on his site. Um, the existing zoning was fine, but his was a sewer issue. So that was really a limiting factor for him redeveloping the Dunkin' Donuts into a mixed-use building and then tearing down the old Dunkin' Donuts and putting up a new one. So there's a variety, you know, again, that's a different set of circumstances. The Passinis that are on Rockwood Road, 
they've held that property in their te- in their family for many many years. So, you know, they have had, yeah, they would like to see development again. The sewer might help them, but they're also not willing to, quite frankly, reinvest tens of thousands of dollars. From what I understand from, you know, re- other tenants that look to to go in there. They're not going to invest in the property. If you want to take on those investments as a tenant, then so be it. So that's an economic. So my point is that there is varying economic factors in all these different properties that um, are coming into play. And I understand that, you know, what we're trying to do is, is, is come to some consensus, but also realizing the constraints that are out there. I mean, Again, I, I think that um, I know Martha and Chris are probably, they've been along the whole entire way and it's uh, has been frustrating. I know Susan and, I, and I, I can understand that, but at the same time, from a planning standpoint, you know, there's the academic exercises, which we're doing some, they're on paper, and then it's the reality of it and trying to get somewhere in between where people have a comfort level for those changes so all right so picking up picking up on rich's comments here right we we do need to get some recommendations for the planning board i think we need to do that at our next meeting our next meeting is currently scheduled for the 21st of september um so rich why don't when we set the agenda for the next meeting why don't you know it's it's to update our our proposed warrant items um yeah. and that that's going to include that's going to need to include some decision on 40r right do we want to include 40r how big is the district? What the district might be? Uh, we need to we need to get our heads, our collective heads, together on that and have a recommendation so that we can we can go to the planning board and say, all right, here's where we are. Um, and I think you know, along with that, we can have Josh do some sort of a you know a short presentation that says, here's all of our new our new information and data, and that new information and data is is led to these updated recommendations. So, so let's, let's make the goal of our next meeting to come out with uh, updated progress recommendations for the planning board uh, to figure out when we can get the MAPC to, to make that presentation along with us to the planning board. And uh, I think it would be good um, to start talking about a public presentation at the town meeting and, and how do we go about making that happen and what is it? Aaron, if you could, I just for one second, um, Rich, I just wanted to clarify something real quick. I didn't, I don't want the impression to be that I feel like the specifically we're wasting our time in the sense of we didn't do something or we aren't doing something correctly. What I meant by that, I just want to make sure it's clear that I support, I support the zoning changes. I support trying to make changes to the downtown area to give residents what they want or to create a viable space. What I meant by wasting our time was that we spent a lot of time debating about the specifics between three or four stories and these 16 versus 20 and 15,000 versus 20,000 square feet. And I meant had if we had done a market analysis earlier, some of those things we could have, what I want to say is what I would have rather have seen is instead of um, a market analysis that fits the changes, I would have liked to have seen a market analysis first, and then we make the changes to fit the market analysis. Does that, am I making sense on that? You know, it's kind of like the, you know, the part before the horse, that's all I was trying to say. I wasn't trying to be negative. I was just wanted to be clear. Um, I think it, if we had had that information or at least some aspects of that information up front, we would have just been able to curtail the zoning changes into that and then presented it to the town in that way. Meaning this is what was done. This is what is financially viable to get you the walkable downtown that we asked for. Here's the time frame that w- it's going to look like if we make these changes, meaning 10 and 20 years, And here are the changes that we need to make for this reason versus going forward with the changes and then coming in with the market analysis later. So I just wanted to be clear on that because I didn't want 
you or any rich, you or anyone else to think that I was saying it was a waste of time in general. That's not what I meant. No, I appreciate it. And I think that just my follow-up comment is that um, I think, I think, you know, Chris and Martha could speak for themselves, but I think, um, I think the, the planning process has its, its high, its positives and its negatives, but I think overall, this process has been lengthy. It has been time consuming, but I think it's also been dynamic to respond to the commentary that's come from the public and the committee to try to get this right. Um, I think that, you know, well, yes, I know it's taken some time and I get it, but I think hopefully the outcome at the end is positive. It's like, you know, you love my, uh, my, uh, chicken piccata but don't go in the kitchen while i'm making it because it's a mess but when it comes out in the end it looks really good so we're in we're kind of in that process right now and it's not as clean as neat and tidy as sometimes you would want it to be and well and, so zoning zoning changes should take a long time because right, right, once, I, once once they are presented you can't do it again for a while and once they are voted on if they are accepted they're generally in effect for a very long time so i don't have a problem with the zoning changes process taking a long time we should be putting an inordinate amount of thought into this process i just think that we, we sort of did things in a little bit of a backwards way and um, i think that's my complaint i'm not i'm not speaking for martha at all she can speak for herself i'm just saying that is how i feel about it and I just yeah. want to make that clear. Well, again, the good news is, is we have it now. So we're going to move forward from here. Um, so Rich, let's, let's work on the agenda and getting the next meeting on the books. Uh, committee members, let's come with our thoughts on the warrant items in 40R. Uh, I do uh, two things I want to get through here. Just Rich, if there's any update on the sewer report or study. But first, I just, there are a couple folks from the public we haven't heard from just wanted to give them a chance to speak up if they so yeah. choose so, uh, eric so. eric diamond yeah uh yeah uh rich i'm having a, a problem with my camera so i'm on the telephone okay can you hear me yeah yes yeah, eric. okay so i i imagine that the uh vision for a walkable downtown includes a restaurant that's something that people would like to see right yes um, so my question is, if you had any one of those parcels, either the green or the yellow, that were fully built, built out, could you support uh, a restaurant in there, given the reduced parking, or is that a, a game? You know, you, you couldn't even potentially have a restaurant underneath a three-story residential. No, I think... Well, I know. Park. How could you come in to see it? Yeah. So it's a minimum. It's not a maximum. But I think if I if I might, Eric, the question is, you know, is could we take one site, maximize the development, get the restaurant, and and everyone would be happy. Uh, and I, Josh, I might need your help on this one, but I I think the answer is is, you know, it's 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 a viable district. It's not one site. Um, I don't know that, uh, it, what we've found is, is that it, it, it takes volume and volume either of people and units, uh, within walking distances of the district to make it a viable district. And, uh, you know, what's the right, you know, Josh mentioned a, a number earlier in the meeting tonight that you need a thousand units within, a five minute walking distance to support one viable block, right? So, you know, if you calculated that number to say, how many units do you need to support one viable restaurant? Yeah, I mean, it's gonna be less than a thousand units, but again, the goal isn't necessarily to add a restaurant downtown. The goal of the committee is to promote a, you know, a commercial, commercially viable district and commercial development downtown, which, you know, may include two restaurants or you know, mm. a restaurant and, and other small commercial spaces. So I, I don't know, maybe Josh, you have an answer, you know, maybe you have another nifty little stat that says you need this many units to support one restaurant. Um, I, I don't know that that's a stat we've, we've discussed in the time we've been talking. 
I don't, I don't have a specific statistic, but I would just generally say that a restaurant is, has been expressed as one of the desired uses for sure. Uh, and it, it could and, and should be accommod accommodated by the type of build out that we've been contemplating. Um, and I don't think that the, the reduced parking assumptions, which are part of that build out would inhibit uh, the, the ability to put a restaurant in one of those ground floor spaces. Uh, I think uh, of all of the in inhibitions to a restaurant in Norfolk Town Center that, that have been contemplated that I think would remain and, and hasn't been necessarily addressed by the build out just is the provision of utilities. Uh, and, and of course, uh, the water wastewater or the sorry, the wastewater situation, not water situation, the wastewater situation would be uh, a major consideration for a restaurant. Uh, and then also the, the potential desire for gas utilities in a restaurant space might also be an infrastructure consideration that may not be currently available. Which is potentially a great segue, uh, unless there's other public comment. Going once, going twice. Kevin, is your hand up for a new one or is it all? New one, very quickly. Uh, we do keep referencing the uh, note that Josh had brought up from his conference where it was identified that a thousand units within a walking radius contribute to a vibrant Main Street. Um, I did touch on that just to put into scope where Norfolk is currently. I don't think that was intended as a measure that we should be planning towards in terms of success or failure. Um, I think that was just something that was said in a very general nature. I've heard it referenced a couple times. Just want to make sure that we're not tagging that as our be all end all of uh, success of this thing. Good clarification. All right, Rich. So that, so it turns out it was a pretty good segue. Any update on our sewer study? Yeah. So actually we had a conference call this morning with uh, Woodward and Kern, myself and Josh, and essentially what we talked about was to kind of get a feel for tonight's presentation as far as, um, had to come back with the sewer. I, what I can tell you so far, um, discussion with the wastewater is that there is by no means, nowhere near the amount of capacity to, to fund that build out that Josh has presented. Um, and that there will need to be additional capacity um, for additional commercial development if you want, it wants to tie to town sewer. Um, the one thing I will share, which actually is probably news to everybody here, perhaps, is that the uh, the thought of tying into uh, the prison wastewater treatment plant was one thing that they investigated. And the, the word from Department of Corrections was that wasn't something that they would want to entertain, um, primarily because what we're looking to do for town center is more mixed use. So it's commercial plus residential. The wastewater treatment plant for the prison is really geared around residential. It's, it's for the prison, the prisoners and that type of use. So uh, their water waste, wastewater treatment plant is really geared towards that. And they have to make upgrades to accommodate future uh, prisoners there. So that at least that alternative is not a viable alternative for us. So that takes that off the table, um, which then brings us towards. Rich, is it is it off the table or is it just not initially deemed welcome? I well, it's more of a, t I, and I can have them elaborate more cl more to that point, Aaron. But it's really it's more of a technical issue that yeah, but con conceivably we could talk about updating the the sewer to manage mixed use waste right and and at the same time upgrade it for the inmates yeah I mean, just um, i'm talking out loud right I, yeah yeah right. i'm trying to be more pragmatic about it but uh yeah i suppose anything's possible but um i think it didn't it didn't appear from discussions with doc that it was really a viable alternative for us because of what we're trying to, I think, accomplish with mixed use. So it's a restaurants, you know, other commercial uses, so forth. Um, but the other thing is to, to come back and try to provide a, 
a combination of what the build out might look for them for planning for sewer, uh, which one is, I don't think we want to try to have them plan and design around maximum build out in Norfolk center. I think that's not a viable option for a variety of different reasons. One from a cost. And I don't think from a desirability from the town, I don't think anything along this discussion has been to have that density that we talked about tonight be achieved It's somewhere in between. So we need to get back to them to run some numbers on sewer and loads to figure out a combination between commercial and residential and what that capacity might look like and then what it would take to build out the system. So we'll, we're going to talk to them at kind of a debriefing after tonight and then we'll, they will come back and we will have more discussion on the sewer, but we're not ready for a larger discussion yet. All right. Thanks, Rich. Yep. Um, one last time around, just to see if the committee members have anything to add before we go. I'm good. Ed, you got anything? No, I just, I just want to confirm the next meeting because the agenda says September 8th. Yeah, 21st of September. Let's shoot for that one. All right. I'll I'll go in and edit the calendar online and get that out of there. Okay, so it's September 21st. Yep. Thank yeah. you. Gary? All set. Eileen? I'm all set as well. Kevin? It's not the end, gracias. Susan? I'm good. Uh, uh, Rich, we should talk uh, about Josephine and. Uh, and yep. her ability to contribute at our next meeting. And we might want to have a conversation with her to bring her up to speed. Um, sure. Yep. All right. All right. Thanks, everybody. Talk right. to you next month, not sooner. Thanks. Yep. Good night. Thanks. Thank you.